Welcome back to News Track. As promised, Channel's Television's in house data analyst Jide Ogunsowo joins me on the News at 10 to discuss OPEC's uh, oil output cut. I want to thank you so much. Now, earlier this week, we saw the figures and what uh, OPEC, the cartel, announced. It cuts oil production to about a million barrels per day. Will this move achieve the goal of uh, raising the price of oil as predicted by energy watchers? It, it depends on how you look at it, Gimba. Um, but <clears throat> this moment reminds me of what had happened um, three decades ago. Professor Tom David West had a similar problem with um, OPEC. And then there was a war. It was a war in the boardroom of OPEC. It was a war between those on one hand that wanted a price cut and those on the second hand that wanted a volume cut. Now, at the end of this very bloody war, those that wanted a volume cut won. Now, that's October 1984. But then, two months down the line, some other thing had happened, and Professor Tam David West had been called to intervene. And that was after there was an agreement in October by OPEC members to go for the volume cut. A lot of these members were accused not to honor that volume cut. So here's how it connects with what is happening today. So OPEC's current aggregated volume output is 33.6 million barrels per day. Now they plan to cut it by approximately 4%, down to 32.5 million barrels per day. So the challenge is, we've seen a history of OPEC agreeing to volume cuts, but not implementing that volume cut. But if indeed, nevertheless, OPEC does stick, at its members stick to this volume cut, then we should be able to see um, oil price of $50 and adding um, upwards um, of $50. Now the second part of it is, there's the Russia involvement in all of this as well. Now, Russia is expected as well to cut oil production by 300,000 barrels. Now, we also know Russia has a history of not achieving and not implementing its own side of the bargain. But if Russia assumes um, its own side of the bargain and reduces oil production by as much as 300,000 barrels, then we, pour, we are in for looking towards seeing oil prices go upwards of 60 $60. But all this is the short and medium term perspective. What will happen in the medium to long term? Now, Gimba, there's no guarantee of what, where oil will be in the medium to long term. And, that's, and there are three reasons why there's no guarantee. The first is shale oil. Now, that's really happening in North mm -hmm. America. Shale oil makes the medium to long term projections for oil price to be uncertain. The second reason is we have a huge global storage of oil in excess of 2 billion barrels. Now that's the second reason why it makes the medium to long term forecast for oil prices uncertain. Now the third reason is to look at non-fossil fuels and I'm talking about solar energy mm -hmm and electrical energy. Now, if you put these three factors together in the medium to long-term perspectives, we are not certain of what the oil prices will look like. But in the short to medium term, if OPEC, OPEC members do honor their commitment to that 1.2 million barrel cut, and if Russia as well honors its commitment to a 300,000 barrel cut, we most likely might see oil hovering between that 50 to 60 dollar band per barrel. Now, I must ask you this question, just hearing what you are just telling us now. Will a higher oil price be in favor of Nigeria or not? Um, it, it depends on um, what perspective. Um, and it, it reminds me of um, a story of two, two twin brothers. And I'll quickly share that with you. Twin brothers had an alcoholic dad. And they saw every day they lived with an alcoholic dad. Now, 15 years down the line, one of these boys was caught in a bar, dead drunk. And they asked him that, what had happened? And his main reason was, he said, his dad. Now they asked his second brother, who wasn't an alcoholic, who was now a successful public speaker, what had happened? And he also pointed to his dad. So clearly it depends on what perspective you want to learn from. Now, how does it connect with what is all happening with, with, with regard um, to, to oil prices? What it means is, how do we want to use this information and what strategy do we want to adopt? Now, clearly with these oil prices, we've seen stocks of some certain airlines drop because it is expected that oil prices will impact aviation fuel and lead to higher 
operating costs for low-cost carriers. So we've seen stocks of some certain international airlines, Ryanair, EasyJet, we've seen those stocks tumble. At the same time, we've seen equities and we've seen prices in all producing firms, shale oil producers, shale as well. We've seen their own um, share prices increase because of the expectation that they would, they would end more. But, but what would be the direct impact looking at Nigeria, for example, and the governors actually need this uh, higher prices to, to be able to pay salaries, for example, and carry out other projects? Uh, yes, you're right. The first impact is if, those, if oil prices continue in the upward trend, then petrol costs for, for instance, is likely not to be what it is this time next year. So there's also an impact on local fuel costs. But for, for the governors, um, the interesting thing about the governors is for us to look at those states that have a lot of stakes with oil assets. And those are the eight states um, that are correct, collecting the 13% um, derivation, Undo, Abia, and um, the five other states um, in the south, south, south. Now, the interesting thing is all these states within January to October this year, there are funds that they've collected from derivation, 187 billion naira. So on that impact, yes, we'll likely see those oil um, states collecting more money in terms of um, their derivation if oil prices go up. But indeed, all other states as well will get some benefits from a higher um, oil price. Now, the interesting thing is, even though we see those eight oil producing states getting 187 billion naira January to October, that's just the economic side. The second way to look at this is the political side. Six out of these eight states are PDP controlled states. So, in simple terms, if you work out the numbers, out of the 187 billion naira that these eight oil producing states have collected for derivation, 182 billion naira out of that, that's approximately 97% of all monies that go into that derivation states are going into PDP states. So in simple terms, what it means is even though the government wants higher oil revenue for the economy, the political implications is the opposition party will be funding, or the, rather the government in, in power uh -huh. right now will be funding the opposition. Always a delight having to hear your analysis. Gideon Gunsawa, in-house analyst, man, thanks indeed. Former President Olusegun Obasanjo today joined Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo and his wife for special prayers for the nation and its leaders at the Aso Villa Chapel in Abuja. The end of year Thanksgiving service also had former leader Yakubu Gowan and Ernest Shoniko. Others are former Vice President Alex Akweme, former Chief of General Staff Rear Admiral Ebitu Ukwike, Ukiwe, and uh, General Oladipo Dia. The chaplain of the Aso Villa Chapel, Pastor Sheyi Malomo, who led the prayers, urged Nigerians, irrespective of their status, to continue to thank God in all circumstances. Senior Special Assistant to the President of National Assembly Matters, Senator Ita Enang, speaks on the significance of the event. We are expecting good leadership from the good lead from the leadership and that's why His Excellency the Vice President has organized that all former heads of state who are of the Christian faith should come join him at the Villa Chapel to thank God for the years past for the, uh, the way God has led us and to pray God for great leading in the years in the years to come for this administration particularly for the economy as he is leading as the president is leading and particularly uh, soon the budget for next year is going to be presented soon uh Right now, they're having an appraisal of last year's budget, and it is good to thank God and ask God's face as we move ahead. Interboundary crisis has been identified as one of the major causes of underdevelopment in any community. While the masterminds of this crisis in most cases go scot-free, the innocent ones, especially school children, are left to suffer the aftermath of the battle, as they have to stay long at home for fear of reprisal attacks. Our community report today examines the aftermath of clashes as it affects educational sector. Now, the results of war, destruction, tears, <laughs> escape. <laughs> This is what the new native community in Odupani local government area of Cross River State was reduced to in September. 
The same situation occurred in Adadama on the Abbey local government area where wanton violence tore the place apart. Months later, both communities are gradually coming out of the shells, although a lot of places are still under lock and key. The schools are the first to slowly come back to life with skeletal classes recorded. The teacher laments what the loss of time means. Those who are going to write exams, we are worried about them, the uh, uh, SS3 and JS3, and even those who are supposed to be writing the state mock uh, next session. So we are worried that uh, normal activities have not taken off. Even the children who are supposed to have registered for JS1, all that has been grounded. Just soliciting for government to come to our aid because people are stranded and it has really affected both strangers and in indigenous here. They are just living in fear. So one government to come to our aid to see what they can do to bring peace so that people can come back to their Residents and feel free. Life without meaningful development in the places that need it will only result in more violence. Honestly, if you want to deal with community problems and things, you have to secularize the approach, developmental approach to that place, modernize those places, take the tools and the platforms and the dynamics of modern life into so that when you are in the remotest village in Nigeria, you are not too far from a train station. You can use your internet. Okay? If you have a secondary school education or polytechnic, you don't feel for your life to have meaning, you must leave your local government. Keeping the peace in cases like these is never easy, but the authorities in charge say they're in control. Our police force has uh, deployed our men to that area to make sure they the restore peace. Presently, the mobile police force also are there to make sure the area is calm. The reasons for the mayhem are things many say could have been resolved amicably by the warring factions. So the hope is that the lessons of the past will be taken to heart to avoid a harsh recurrence in future. Etisola, now you And now to the arts. The Lagos Photo Festival attracted established and budding photographers from across the continent to the commercial hub. An art review tonight will look at what they had to display in the photo festival. Lights, camera and action. Well, that's been the drill for at least seven years now. This year, rituals and performance is the theme the photographers are focusing on. They look at the identity and what makes Africa stand out, its values as well as a strong tradition that is passed on from one generation to the next. We have 40 different artists from 18 different parts of the world um, and we've invited them based on the work they've created based on the theme. Our theme this year is rituals and performance and um, we're basically looking at the way our everyday rituals, our everyday routines kind of shape our identity, who we are as Africans, who we are as women, as men. Who our identity so that's basically what all the works here are basically talking about in some sort of way rituals and performance some of these artists question the role of civilization and how it has turned something so alive and colorful to look the basin the, the theme of this uh, festival is ritual and performance and the photographs you saw was also the documentation of the first enactment of I trust, you know, jeweler in Lagos. And when we did the documentation, we have the beat photographs, and the photographs show the processes of what actually the rituals and the ontology 
the ontology of the of the object that I use as as some kind of interaction. I don't wish like a statement. And the statement is as a human being, the most uh, basic ritual we do every day is walking on the earth. It's not enough to just capture it in images. Others go the extra mile to put up performances that drives this message home. The performance today is titled, I Trust You Know Ojuile, which is uh, trying to make uh, a statement on our interaction between the nature and, and ourselves. You know, and that's why you see me using element of the tree, of the plastic sheeting, and the calabash. So it's, it's just trying to make a statement about our interaction with essentially what even the, the nature itself. And I try to ask questions. Like I said, do you know, because Ojuile is in Yoruba means the eye of the earth. Do you know the eye of the earth? For the organizers, this fiesta has always been a revelation. You don't have to travel outside of the world to see the best of photography or the best of African photography. A lot of the time, there's no space where you can go and see, you know, what the best African contemporary photographers are creating. And that's what we wanted to do here at Lagos Photo. Instead of us flying to London or to New York, why don't we fly the world here into Lagos to show the best of African con contemporary photography, both local artists and international artists together, exhibiting work together for a month in different venues in Lagos. Photographers from across the globe gather for this show every year. It's not just an opportunity to see great pictures, but a chance for budding photographers to rub shoulders with their international contemporaries and learn a thing or two. Next on the news at 10, Everton and Manchester United settle for a 1-1 draw at Goodison Park in the Super Sunday Clash in the English Premier League. Stay with us.